Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly interview show where top chess players, authors, content creators, and accomplished amateurs discuss their careers and share stories and chess improvement tips. Perpetual Chess is a part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network, and we'd like to give special thanks to our presenting chess education sponsor, Chessable.com. For more information about the show, you can go to perpetualchesspod.com. But without further ado, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are here with another Adult Improver edition, and I am joined by a fellow chess podcaster. Our guest is the host of the Detroit Chess Killers podcast. He's also a scholastic chess coach uh, based, as you might guess, in Detroit. And he recently had a breakthrough in his OTB chess. Uh, He earned the USCF rating of 2000, which for those of you from outside the U.S. or those of you who are online players, that categorizes you as a USCF expert. It basically means you're in the 95th percentile of all USCF players. And, you know, I've been checking out this gentleman's, I've been listening to his podcast here and there for years. And I know he works hard on his game and I was really happy to see this breakthrough. Um, So happy to welcome him to the show. Derek Wilder, thanks for joining us. How are you, sir? I'm fine with you, sir. God bless and uh, good to meet you and be on here, sir. Yeah, yeah. Glad to have you. And, And honestly, Derek, when I look at your rating graph, like, you know, when I interviewed Elijah Logazar, he was talking about how he likes to just look at people's rating graphs. Mm. And I don't do that as like a matter of hobby. But when I'm like interested in hearing someone's story or like I knew you had broken through to experts. So I pulled up your, your USCF graph just to 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 see the story. And and it's like when I look at the graph, I see all the blood, sw- blood sweat and tears. You know, like I, I heard you mention in, in your most recent episode that you took 10 years off from like uh age 17 to age 27, and you can see that in the graph, and then you see you come back rated around 1750 and, you know, play for a year, take a year off, and then really come back and just kind of grind your way, and then boom, finally jump up. So first of all, Derek, congratulations, and second of all, how'd you do it? Let's hear it. Uh, First of all, I want to say thank you, and I appreciate it. So just to give you uh, a background on my history, I grew up in Detroit. We have something as they call the Detroit Metro Scholastic Chess League. And it's a chess league that's ran by Detroit Public Schools, where all the public schools have a chess team. So chess has been in the Detroit Public Schools for, i say, about 20 years. And I came up playing uh, in them Saturday tournaments uh, every weekend. So that's where I got my beginning. Uh, the program was ran by Dr. Paul Grams. Uh, God rest his soul. He had passed. He was my uh, chess coach, and he ran the league. And uh, we had tournaments every every Saturday. And through that, I had peaked at about 1754 when I was 17. And I believe that put me like in the top 100 at that time. For I think my age group, 18 and under during that time. And uh, like you said, for me and a lot of people in Detroit, it's hard to play chess and make a living. So when I got about 17, you know, I'm 1700. Seven, just say 1754, whatever I was, you know, you have to make that decision is I'm going to work or I'm going to play, you said play chess. So uh, fortunately I had to take some time off and, you know, get my financial situation, you know, straight for me to, you know, get back and be, uh, become, you know, play chess seriously because you, you, as a chess player, you invest a lot of time in chess, a lot of countless, countless hours, and you also need the finances. So I had to, you know, take a break and get myself together. That's why I took that from 17 to 27. I didn't play no tournament chess, but I was still playing chess. Turn, I mean, still playing chess with my friends. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, we're just glad you came back, Derek. I mean, I, I would guess that the majority of people listening to this, you know, the majority are definitely adults. And I would say the majority have spent at least a year away from chess at some point. Um, and tournament players, a year away from tournament chess. I certainly have spent my fair share of time away, but... But it was it's good that you came back. And what was your mindset at 27, Derek, when you did come back? Uh, So what got me back in chess is, like I said, I always played chess. I just didn't play tournament chess. Like when right. I wasn't playing every week, uh, we have a guy, his national master named John Brooks. And we would go to the chess club and we would just play speed chess. But what got me back into playing chess is I was offered a coaching position at Chrysler Elementary School where I coach at now. And, uh, you know, getting back in it, taking the kids to chess tournaments, 
and you know telling them about your scholastic stories and they like no nah, they can't believe you and there was no history right. of you i said well uh one of my kids you know he used to really go in on me like you can't play chess such and such so <laughs> that kind of motivated me to get back into you know playing chess and you know once i got back into the groove of things uh i stuck with it so my job allows me to play chess so it's 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 a beautiful thing yeah yeah and <laughs> and what age are most of the kids that you're coaching Derek? At Chrysler Elementary School, it's an elementary school. So I start at kindergarten. It goes all the way to fifth grade. But I'm also a part of Detroit City Chess Club. And them kids can go anywhere from kindergarten to 12th grade. So I have seniors. Yeah, from kindergarten to 12th grade. Okay. And Derek, in your most recent episode, your interview with uh, National Master Kofi Tatum, you also mentioned that when, when you were a kid growing up in Detroit, um, you know, Detroit, of course, here in the U.S. has has a rich history. The Motor City, it's it's a... You know, it's got a lot of charm. I've been there, but of course, it also has a. It's you know, it's known to have a, a high crime rate. Um, and you mentioned that as being being a kid and and being bullied because of chess. Well, yeah, like when I came up, start playing Scholastic Chess. It wasn't like now with social media, Twitch, YouTube. It wasn't perceived in an African African American household as something to do. You know, uh, in our culture, you know, the black parents football, basketball, boxing. So when I decided to get into chess, you know, I was kind of looked at as an outsider. And, uh, you know, I dealt with that from pretty much uh, elementary school to high school, which, you know, I dropped out, uh, you know, because it's, it's, it's different because during that time when you played chess, you know, they labeled you as a geek, nerd, you know, during them times. Now it's more yeah. acceptable. So yeah, me yeah. and my friends, we 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 went through that uh phase, but you know, it it turned out for the uh, better for us in the long run. Yeah, I mean, and now being a fairly young guy yourself, I'm sure it's good that like you're there as a teacher. You're you're a role model. So I, I agree that the atmosphere has changed somewhat. And my you know, I'm not I don't have um my my ear to the ground um so much, but it seems to me that and I've mentioned this before on the pod, I feel like generally um, niche activities are more accepted uh, in, in, you know, across the board now because of the internet, because you can sort of find a like-minded community, no matter what it is that you're into. Mm -hmm. um, but, but nonetheless, um, I, you know, I do think it probably helps that, that you're teaching, but let me ask you, Derek, like, how did you and your friends deal with that when, when it was happening? Well, okay. So I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I probably had me and one of my other friends probably had it worse because we just played chess. The other uh, the other group of my friends, they played chess, but they were athletes. So uh, I'm just going to be honest with you. We be, we became gamblers. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is, uh, you know, playing chess in the lunchroom for money, you know, crazy spot, time, odds, and all that other stuff, where we were still looked at as geeks and strange, but it was like we had a unique talent. You know, imagine going uh, – into the lunchroom and telling somebody, well, I could beat you without looking at the board. You see what I'm saying? Right. Stuff yeah. like that. So as we got older, we kind of used that to our advantage and they started becoming more acceptable, you know what I'm saying, of us being chess players. That's good. Uh, and obviously, as we said, you took a lengthy break from tournament chess when you were, um, you know, when you were 17, although it sounds like, as you said, still in the chess world. But when you were a teenager, did it ever get so bad where you were like, man, I don't know if I'm cut out for this. I don't want to hear people's crap. You know, I'm, I'm not going to play chess anymore. It, 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 never, it never got that bad because one thing about me, I never let peer pressure, you know, change my uh, decision of chess because it was something I like to do. And what really motivated me to continue playing is I was I was real, real competitive because a lot of people don't know is when I was coming up, this is where James Canney started to come on the chess scene. Like, I've been knowing James Canney 20 years plus. So I went from, it was me, I had another friend, his name Joseph Gass, and he just passed. He was the first expert from Detroit. He was an expert at 16. So we were chasing Joe, and while we were chasing Joe, boom, we got to James Canney you know, he came out of nowhere. So it was like, even though I was dealing with all that other stuff, I couldn't let this boy steal my spotlight eventually. <laughs> but eventually, like you said, he passed me and all that other stuff. But the 
competitor in me was just like, no, I'm still going to play chess. You know, I can't let this guy steal my thunder. But, you know, he, like you said, became a national master at 16. And, you know, we're, we're great friends. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. I've mentioned on the pod before, I grew up with the Shahadis, and Greg Shahadi is one year younger, and we started out on relatively equal footing, and eventually I just had to tip my cap to him and be like, all right, you know, um, you're you're on another plane. And and uh, shout out to James. I know he just had a, a breakthrough tournament in in Charlotte, and um, yeah, yeah, he's 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 a talented guy. So um, no shame in uh, in him eventually passing you. Um, so let's bring it forward, Derek. So. You come back Mm -hmm. and, you know, as I saw in your sort of tournament history, it looked like you came back and you got 100 points pretty quickly and then you took another year off. And it might be kind of hard to separate since, as you say, tournaments are one thing, but it sounds like you've been pretty involved in the chess world all along. But let's hear about the the grind. Let's hear about the journey. Like, uh, what were the challenges along the way? And, you know, um, did you always feel like like you were going to, you know, you were making progress? Well, uh, in Detroit, I have a reputation of uh, being, I was always called an underachiever. Uh, they said I always have phenomenal, phenomenal talent, but always underachieve. So when I was a scholastic kid, chess was easy to me because I remember having the John Nunn chess uh, opening book, the big purple gold book. And the MCO, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the MCO. So I used to beat everybody like, Everybody in my circle, we used to play the max lane. So the Italian game, we'd be up in pieces and all that other stuff. So I pretty much got to 1,700 just off traps and zaps, like Bruce Pagasini. So when I stopped playing chess and came back to playing chess, as you can see, the inconsistency was I had to learn how to play chess all over again. The theory changed. The openness that I was playing as a kid is not winning no more. The kids got access to databases and engines. So it was, uh, you know, and then old lines, this line's not in no more. You know, it was so it took me, I say, about a couple years to start understanding what did I had, you know, what I had to do. For example, I remember the first tournament, uh, second tournament I went to uh, after getting back to playing chess, it was the Motor City Open. It's a uh, annual Thanksgiving tournament. I played a kid and I played the Grand Prix and I played an old line. And I never forget, I'm at the board just using all my time trying to remember the main lines. Mm-hmm. And the kid had to be no younger than 10. And I'm spending 20 minutes move. He'd just come to the board, move, walk, and just, just walk all around the tournament hall. And I was so frustrated and I was tired and I lost that game. And it was like, I know the kid wasn't talented in me, but it was like I, I got to figure out what's 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 going on, and then that's when I discovered. Because I'm from the, I'm pretty sure you was the ICC, US yeah, Chess yeah. Live era. That's when I discovered Chess.com, Lead Chess, and all these free sources. Because when I was a kid coming up, it was chess base. I couldn't afford chess base. My parents couldn't afford chess base, so I had to really, really do some research to improve my lines and variations and stay uh current because chess is chess is changing you know constantly yeah i mean honestly like i mean it's come up on the pod a lot and you just alluded to it like you know at least now 2022 like you know if you came back in 2016 like you know you probably have to subtract 50 points 100 points from your rating just because like the scale has changed people everyone's gotten better you know so that that makes what you've achieved um all all the more um impressive now derek so you know everyone has a different approach to to chess learning you know there's there's obviously book learners there's the hikaru just learn by playing blitz uh which not everyone can pull off but it's a uh, Good, good work if you can get it. Um, and I know you've been at, mentioned you've been working on all aspects of your game, but but primarily, what kind of chess learner would you say that you are, Derek? Uh, I struggled. I struggled because I didn't. I had to learn how to study chess. And what I mean by that is, I was working on one aspect of the game, my opening prep. So I was prepping on my opening prep, but then I was getting outplayed in the middle game. And then I work on the middle game, and then I would get outplayed in the. Uh, the end game. So I had to really sit back and find out what's my strengths and weaknesses. 
And uh, like Mike Z said, either I'm going to make my strengths as strong as possible and try to, you know, beat you like that or have be solid all around. So one thing that helped me is uh, a, na- a Tulia Shetty, international master Tulia Shetty from uh, Detroit. And uh, we was playing blitz and he was like, Derek, uh, you just can't attack all the time. <laughs> what I mean by that is when I was play chess, because I would play a lot of street chess, I would just attack, attack, throw the whole kitchen sink at you. And I remember him telling me, he said, Derek, after your after I defend your attack, you got double pines, you got isolated pines. Your position is done. So I'm just gonna trade off and just win. And uh it took me a long time to uh understand where he was coming from and realize like hey, this pine structure stuff and learning how to hold the position and you know, it's, 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 it takes a lot, but that was something that really, really opened my eyes. Just some conversations with, with Atulia. I had a feeling you're an attacking player, Derek. Do you, do you know any guesses why I thought that is? It's not really fair. You won't guess, but any guesses? I, I have no idea. <laughs> it's because I, I, in your interview with Kofi Tatum, you asked him a question like, so do you like to play E4 and go for an attack or do you like to play that boring stuff? Oh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, since you put it that way, I was like, well, I guess I know how Derek likes to play. Yeah. But you know what? As I've got older, I've, as I've got older, like I started off with E4, but as I got older, I've started to play D4 night after in C4. Yeah. And <laughs> see, I'm in a, sorry, go ahead. And the reason you, I think now, like when I was younger, it was attack, attack. But now as I get older, I believe you have to have a uh, positional knowledge when it comes to chess because a good position is going to lead to strong tactics. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that, that's what that's that's exactly what they say. And yeah, I thought of the same thing. I grew up as an attacking player. And yeah, now I, I'm mostly playing one night F3. And, you know, I but I mean, I still like to attack. It's just, uh, you know, it's it's just the attack comes on move 25 instead of move 12, you know? Um, I, I understand. I understand it. <laughs> all right. Well, Derek, we're going to take a break and then we're going to dig deeper into all of your chess improvement secrets. I've been digging deeper, looking at my analytics on aimchess.com, specifically trying to improve my time management at Blitz Chess, as you guys have heard me discuss before. They have this tab called long thinking where you can look to see what the outcome of moves where you spend a lot of time is. And for me, it turns out those moves tend to be better than average compared to my rating peers. So my issue is I just need to play a little bit faster every single move. It's not so much about avoiding the long things. And there's tons of insights you can get like that from aimchess.com. You can check it out for free. Explore all phases of your game with actionable drills that you can then review and download games where issues arise. Uh, So check it out for free. And if you subscribe, use the promo code perpetual30 on aimchess.com. And we are back. And Derek, as I mentioned, when I messaged you on Twitter and said like, hey, you know, so how did you get better at chess? You you were like, well, I worked on my opening and I worked on my middle game and I worked on my end game. And I was like, well, <laughs> that pretty much covers it. But, you know, that doesn't help that much because obviously we all work on everything. So getting back to what you quoted uh, Mike Zelazny about, shout out to Mike. Did you decide to strengthen your strengths or um, shore up your weaknesses? Well, I, let, let me do a better job at explaining that. Okay, so... When I come back to chess, I have one good tournament. I go from 1740 to 1850. I'm I'm 1800 now, right? I was stuck at 1800 for like almost, I think about two, three years. Yeah. And I realized I had every rating gap I got to, I had to learn chess again. So when I got to 1800, everybody knows openings. Everybody knows tactics. Everybody knows this. So I had to really go back and search like theory. And this during the time, like you said, me and James Candy is we're real close friends. This is the time when Jimmy is playing uh the Accelerated Dragon with Black, the Grand Prix with White. We're, we're all playing the same things because this this is right. our friend. So uh I had to look at, you know, okay, I put it like this. This is what you tell me. This is the opening. I use the accelerated dragon and then look at the end game to it. This is the position you want to get to the end, you know what I'm saying? The end game and all that other stuff. So once I started learning that. I start the games I would lose 
like have a bad position. Now I'm getting draws with them. See what I'm saying? And now my rating is not dropping. I mean, I'm right. there, but I'm not, you know what I'm saying, dropping. So as I as yeah. I proved that, it was like, okay, Derek, now we gotta we gotta build up the middle game. And uh Josh Pasuma from Michigan is probably I think he's gonna be a grandmaster in the next couple of years. Uh he is like one of the best middle game players I've ever saw in my life to be so young. And uh we was playing and he just he just crushed me and he just kept kept crushing me. And I'm like, how is you crush me? He's uh oh, Derek, you see this isolated pine right here? Or you see this weakness. So then I had to I had to focus on weakness and keeping my pieces active. It was like you said, I'll I'll say this too. I had a lot of help uh with me getting over that hump. And a lot of it is due to the uh podcast. I've had uh help from Gopal, he's helped me. Jelan Swartz, uh I'm trying to think, uh Orlando Husbands, they take a lot and they really have all dropped some gems into improving my game. Like if I was to show you my lead chest study with some of the stuff they showed me, it almost looked like the Bible. Nice. <laughs> that's that's excellent. So I mean, it sounds like you rely on, you know, you've built a good network and I'm sure like, as you say, hosting Detroit chess killers, that, that doesn't hurt. And yeah, go Paul Manon helped me out. Uh, when we recap under the surface, he's a opening, I mean, chess genius generally, but like really knows his openings in, in particular and a blitz specialist. So it, would you say Derek, that that's your primary method of learning from sort of networking and sort of getting lessons from your friends and, uh, you know, um, colleagues? Uh, that helps, but also I'm, I'm a hard worker and a lot of, uh, what I mean by hard worker is when I'm off and I got some free time, I'm actually on the porch with the, and I know my kids don't do it, but I have the chess books and the hard copy books with the pieces going over and, uh, reading, you know, like, uh, I still read my system, amateurs, mine, uh, Silman's in game book, uh, Dorfsky, Dor I can't pronounce it. Dorfsky's in, yeah, still, yeah. Uh, do that to get the the feel of the game, and uh, like I've read my system like three, four, five times, and every time I read it, I learn something new. It doesn't put you. To I sleep. mean, it puts me to sleep. But like <laughs> Josh Possum would say, man, to get good, you're gonna have to sacrifice a lot of things, and I have to force myself to uh, <laughs> stay woke. But like you said, I really want to become a national master, and that's the goal. So I know I have to really, really, really study. And chessable, chessable helps me too. So what do you like to do on chessable? Like openings and uh, tactics? Everybody what? study tactics. Everybody study tactics. The kids study. It's more of in games and middle game stuff for me with chessable. Okay. And are you like regimented about your schedule? Do you, do you say like, I'm going to spend a certain amount of hours a day. I'm going to spend a certain amount of hours on certain aspects of my game. Or is it just kind of like, take it as it comes? Take it as it comes because you wouldn't believe this. I play chess every day. I believe it, man. I checked your <laughs> I checked your lead chess. <laughs> I play chess. I play chess every every day. Uh online over the board. Uh we have a chess club here, all the Kings Men Chess Club. Uh I have the key to it. Uh it has a awesome. library in there. I could go in there like right now. Uh I guess I could, I could go in there right now and play chess and grab me any book I want to. So uh I, I do it all when it comes to chess. And when you alluded to your kids, does that mean the kids that you teach? Yeah, like for me with Scholastic Kids, I said like this. A lot of kids join the chess team because we travel, right? So you're going to get your kids that's just going to do it for fun, win the trip to the Nationals. But every year I have, since I've been coaching, I have two or three kids that really take a liking to it and really uh, go hard for it, like, uh, I've, I got, I got some kids that's 18, 1900 that could really pass me right now. And they should do it because they don't, they're not grown. They're not paying no bills. Yes, right? sir. Yeah. Yeah. So Derek, and you mentioned, um, working with the kids now with the kids, do you like warn them about, or like, are you, do you worry that you're sending them down a path where there's there's not a lot of money to be made in chess or i mean do you feel like it's generally a productive activity for them to be engaged in no i never tell them that i'll tell them you play chess because you love chess you don't even think about the money because if you're good the money's going to come for example in detroit we have sharice woods i know you heard of her she's one of the yeah. top players uh female players probably in the country in the united states she's been overseas 
this is her last year. She's going into her senior year. She's been 1,800 since she's been in middle school. And we tell her, if you don't get it done now, if you don't break 2,000 now, it's going to be hard to do it, you know what I'm saying, once you graduate from high school. And uh, we're not trying to force it on her, but we try to explain it to her. If you don't do it now, it's going to be hard when real life kicks in. Yeah, and obviously Canty's a great example, I mean, of, of what someone can can get from chess. Um, cool. Well, we got a couple questions from listeners, Derek. Let me uh, jump into the first one. Uh, people who support Perpetual Chess can can send in questions for our guests. And this question is from Alex Friedman, who says, congrats on reaching expert. How important was theoretical endgame knowledge for this? Oh, it was key. It was key. And what I mean by that is, one thing I struggled with was isolated pawns. <laughs> And playing them in games and positions and all that other stuff. And I think if I didn't improve on my in game, I probably still would have been like stuck at 1900. So how did you study them? Uh, playing a, playing a lot of them, playing a lot of, I'm going to tell you what's rook in games. If you yeah. can, and I haven't even mastered it yet, but if you rook and pine in games are to me some of the most hardest in games play because the game can either, you can make the wrong move and it could be a draw or you can play it accurate and win the game. So I looked at a lot of rook and pine in games and sometimes I still play them wrong. Of course. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's like 600 page books written for grandmasters about them. So it goes without saying I'm, I'm right there with you. So, Derek, you mentioned rook and pawn endings. Obviously, they can be a challenge for anyone. So how specifically do you study them? It's, it's, it's tough. It's tough and it's frustrating. But uh, setting up all type of uh, positions in uh, Karpov. I, li- I like a lot of Karpov games. So I look at a lot of his uh, end games. And uh, like I said, playing a lot of like rook positions like for example, I give it to you. I'm making call Jimmy. I call him Jimmy or Josh Pasuma or even Cameron Tolliver. Hey, man, what you doing today? Or I'm getting ready for a tournament. Nothing. Uh, let's get together. Let's just play these positions. Or we just look at an end game, you know, out of book and all that other stuff. And we just play them over. See if we're going to play it right. And then write the moves down. Then go to the engine. Oh man, we we played it horrible. You know, and I'm just saying we're playing white. Oh man, this we did this whole thing horrible. The engine got black minus over. All right, we got to set it up and do it again and again and again. But it gets frustrating because you be feeling like I'm never going to get this right. But you you just keep trying. You just keep trying. Sounds like you got some good friends. Do you ever do it against an engine or always against a friend? Uh, I try to do it against the friends because when I do it with the engine. I get angry and frustrated, but then I realize that the computer doesn't have no emotions and feelings. So I do. I like yeah. to do it with my friends first and then put it on the engine. Like we, we so crazy with it. We a bet, a bet $5. You know what I'm saying? We do it right. And then put it on the engine just to make it, you know, better us because I know the engine is pretty much going to play the best move all the time. Yeah. Um, and let me ask you, since Alex's question was about theoretical end games as opposed to uh, practical, which it sounds like when you mentioned something like Karpov's games, that's more practical. That's like studying how someone converted a position rather than like how you execute the Lucina position or whatever. Um, but you did mention so- Silman's end game manual earlier. So how much are you spending on what they call the theoretical endings, the ones that you're just supposed to memorize? i am be honest with you. I just had a... A lesson on that and uh i have to do them every week because if i don't refresh my memory i'm gonna forget it yeah um and uh it's it's hard because majority of the games i play i don't get them positions of course yeah when it does happen have you for example have you been playing chess like i know the position i saw it before but i got to remember the principles and the rules to to of course yeah when it so I, I have I have to do the uh, practice them like once or twice a week. But you do it. Yeah, I mean I I I I do it. Like I've butchered a lot of end games that I should have, uh, because like you said, the end game is kind of boring. You know, there's no excitement in it, and I, I'm fighting myself to get over that hump. But I'm doing way better at it. Yeah, that's great, man, and obviously it's paying off. 
And maybe this will lead into your answer to this next paste around question. This one is from Dr. Courtney Fry, who's also been on the show as a, an adult improver who writes in to ask, and thanks for supporting the pod as always, Courtney. Courtney asks, he says, congratulations on achieving expert. Did you make any adjustments to your training approach when you found yourself in a plateau? Did you try to focus on one area of an improvement during a particular period or just generally try to improve? And did you ever find you had improved after taking a break and then coming back? So actually a bunch of questions there, Derek, but uh, take it where you want it. There's a lot to, uh, lot to um, uncover from that. Okay, so my did my training method change? Yes, it did. It train it changed tremendously. And what I mean by that is I had to be how can I say invested in the I know it sounds crazy, invested in the game 100%. And what I mean by that is when I was playing chess, it was attack, attack, attack. Now when I go in, I look for a return on my investment. And what I mean by that is when I'm playing chess, I'm still trying to attack, but I'm also scanning your position deep for weaknesses, tied down pieces. Uh, and I realized that I cannot win every game checkmate. Some games is going to be long, drawn out, uh, grinding out games. Like I have to, for example, we always say if Magnus get up one pawn, he can win the game. He's like 80, I mean, 97% chance of winning the game. I had to become one of them players with them positions. And sometimes uh, I had to learn. Okay, so this is the best example. I was playing, I, this is the best. I was playing a game. I was attacking. And my opponent was defending great. But he had double pawns. But. His most act, his best piece on the board was a queen, right? That was his best defender and attacker and all that other stuff. But I'm attacking with the queen. Old me would have kept the queens mm -hmm. on the board. New me traded his best defending piece was the queen and just won an easy end game. How that sound? <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds like good progress. <laughs> so stuff like that, just the small things like Derek, you don't, you do not have to checkmate or sack, 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 mate. It's okay to liquidate and play. Uh, I mean, it's, you still got to play it right, but win convincingly and easy, stuff like that. So that was a big, big improvement in my rating because for one, for a period of time, I had this thing of winning in style. I always wanted to have the highlight, flashy wins. And once I got over that, uh, it helped me. And, I had, and another thing that helped me is I had no problem trading the queens. I was also one of the players that always wanted to play with the queens on the board. Once I got used to using every piece, uh, that helped me. So it, it 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 was it was a it was a lot of lot of work and understanding uh, middle game concepts and uh, just it's it, it's it's just it's just a lot of lot of work, but. That's the best example I, I can give as far as improving, having no problem trading down and winning the game. Just knowing, like, if I trade down, I'm up a pawn. Or if I trade down, my opponent's not going to be able to hold this pawn because it's a weakness or his position is going to break. And just playing out them long games where your opponent's going to run out of moves and you're going to have an extra tempo to win the game. Stuff like that helped me. So let me ask you, Derek, when something like that happens, like I feel I feel like it's a common transition for an attacking player. Um, you you know, you have to have learn to have a more balanced style. But when you reach these positions, like the one you describe with the doubled pawns, like do you feel like you have like the devil and the angel on your shoulder? One telling you, like, you know, you you gotta keep queens on the board, you gotta attack, and then on your other shoulder, you have the angel telling you, like, no, Derek, you gotta do what the position demands. Like, is there still like an internal struggle when you have these positions? Of course, of course. I'm gonna give you another example. See, I'm I'm the type of player, I used to be a type of player. Uh, for me, some people just have a feel of the board. Like, they don't have to analyze. They just know it looks right. And that actually cost me some money at the Chicago Open under 1900 section. Uh, I was playing the game. I was winning. I had a crushing position. And uh, I had the signature Grand Prix attack. And me just looking at the board, doing all that puzzle rush and all that other stuff, 
I just went for a sacrifice. It looked good, but it fizzled out. And if I would have just sat there and kept improving my position and improving my position and improving my position, I would have just broke through and won the game. So, yeah, I, I, I go through them moments, but I'm getting better at it now. I mean, it takes a lot of more time analyzing, but I look at every piece on the board. Is the pieces tied down? Uh, is it bad? Key squares and all that other stuff. So, yeah, I, I, I go through it. I go through it. Like I said, it me trying to be flashy, it cost me some money at a Chicago Open. And and once that happened, it, it sounds like you made a breakthrough. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's great. So, and I see you play, as we mentioned, you, you play a lot of Blitz. I, I saw your, your profile. You'd played like 6,000 games on Lee Chess, and that's not even to mention <laughs> Chess.com, where you also play. Um, so... What's your approach to Blitz, Derek? I mean, are you like the, you know, are you just like binging games or are you analyzing them? Like, are you, I mean, I know a lot of us like aspire to review our Blitz games, but don't necessarily do it. Where where do you come down? Okay, so if I play 6,000 games, I'm be honest with you, probably about 3,000 of them is with my friends. And what I mean by that is we get up, all right, uh, for example, my friends, they're getting ready to go to Chicago Open. And uh, all right, Derek, I want to play this line, and we just we just play each other. All right, okay, that didn't work. We're gonna try this, and uh, that's where that uh come from. The other games is just me me playing chess, elite chess arenas, because I feel like with blitz chess, I could try anything. I could practice an opening, a new line, a new variation, stuff like that. So it's kind of like my trial and error, my piece. I could try this, I could try that. That doesn't work. I go back over it. And then I make improvements to transition to my tournament game. And are you going to go to the Chicago Open? Uh, if I go, I'm 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 not going. I'm not going to play because I've been organizing uh chess tournaments here in Michigan for like the last three months. That's great. How's that going? Uh, it's fine because coming out the uh pandemic. Before the pandemic, we used to have a lot of scholastic tournaments in Michigan, but since we're kind of opening up, there's not a lot of tournaments uh, in Michigan, especially out for the scholastic kids. So with me coaching a lot of kids, I have to give them something to do because I lost a lot. A lot of kids quit chess on me due to COVID, the two years, because we went virtual. So now we're coming back out, and there weren't a lot of tournaments. And like you said, this Thursday – we're taking a group of kids to the elementary nationals and uh, Ohio and they're not the sharpest. So I'm trying to just keep them as active as possible. That's got to be an amazing experience for these kids though, right? Yeah. Yes. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing experience because uh, we have a lot of talented, talented kids, but like you said, you got, you got to keep them playing. You got to keep them playing. And another thing I want to say is, with me coaching, you can have a kid to middle school, but about time they get to high school, that's where they're going to make the decision. Is they're going to play basketball, baseball, cheerlead, academic games, or they're going to play chess. And majority of the time, you lose the kids uh, to other activities. They try to do both, but they eventually they fizzle out. So I'm trying to give them as much opportunities to play as they can. Good for you. Yeah. Um, and. Derek, we're going to take one more break, and then I've got a few more questions for you. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Of course, by now, I hope you all know that Chessable uses its proprietary move trainer technology to quiz you on the chess sequences that you need to remember. Often, it will be an opening sequence, a tactical pattern, or even a crucial end game, and they've got courses to help you with all aspects of your game. Some of their new courses incl- include Grandmaster Romain Edwards, English Breakfast, which is the reverse Sicilian against the English, and the Decem- Deceptively Simple French Exchange by I Am Sam Collins. So many more new courses coming out practically every day, so be sure to go to chessable.com and check out both their free and their for-purchase offerings. So Derek, on the topic of teaching these kids, like when you introduce your students to chess, generally, how do they receive it? Are they excited right away? Does it do, does it take convincing? 
Uh, it, it varies. It varies. Every kid reacts to it different. Like I've had kids that rejected it, and then I take them to a tournament and I let them see it firsthand, and then they get excited. Then I have some that just jump on it and just be excited. So it depends on the kid's mentality. That makes sense. And do they know, like, do they, you mentioned like part of the reason you got back into chess, um, to tournament chess was so that they, when they talk trash, you could say, Hey, look, man, I'm out there. I'm out there as well. Like do any of your students, did they know about your journey towards expert? Like, and, and how big a goal was that? I know you've mentioned you want to make master as well. Was expert like a big goal for you? Yeah, expert was a big goal to me because I felt like I should have did it in high school. <laughs> like, uh, I was almost 1800, uh, 1750, I think, going into my 11th, 12th grade year. And I could have done it. So it was something that I just had to get off my chest. It took it took a lot to get there, but it was, it was something I had to scratch off the bucket list. And then with me and my kids is them seeing me play chess, for example, here we have a tournament where the coaches and the kids play together. So them seeing me play chess with them motivates them. You know, we play against other coaches. Like I'll be bored one and then the rest of my kids would be bored too. Like that motivates them. And I think uh, that inspires them to keep on playing. Yeah. And you mentioned one kid rated 1800, another rated 1900. I guess you got a couple nipping at your heels, right? Yeah, but like like I tell my kids, I'm I'm gonna be honest with you. I tell them the day y'all beat me today, I'm gonna lay down the pieces. So that <laughs> hasn't happened. So I'm gonna keep on playing chess. Cause no, I'm, no, that's not a good attitude. Mo a lot of teachers are like, I want you, I want you to beat me. The sooner, the better. I want them to beat me, but I'm never gonna tell them that. I right, played them okay. so hard. I played them so hard, yeah. so hard. For example, uh, I was having a bad tournament, and I was playing a kid. His name Braylon Fields. He goes to Bates, and he was actually beating me. And uh, he should have won the game, but I didn't resign. And he was looking at me like, why you ain't going to resign? I was like, I'm going to make you earn it. And uh, he blundered, blundered bad. And I came back and beat him in the end game. That, that's cool. That's yeah, that, that'll that keep him hungry. I have one student of mine who's like, yeah, <laughs> the battles are getting more intense. I have to, you know, no multitasking when I play him anymore. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. And I also play D4 against all the students because they, they hate it. <laughs> yeah yeah and what about you like you you know you've you've mentioned working on your openings how big a point of emphasis are they for you Derek? okay so we just had this conversation i think openings really play i know when i was coming up they used to say the end game but i think openings really play a key key factor because if you don't know what you're doing with them openings you could really get steamrolled off the board and i just saw it happen all levels of chess i saw it in gm uh games I am. I really think with the computer and the engines and the way they prep now for opening lines, you really got to know your stuff. Because if if not, uh, you you will take a long walk in the forest by yourself and get <laughs> yourself hurt. Yeah. Sh shout out to Mikhail Tall. Um. So, how would you put it together, Derek? I mean, it's it sounds like you know you're you're doing a little bit of everything, but if you were to and it sounds like, you know, your your life is so sort of enveloped in chess that it might be hard for you to even answer this. But I have to ask anyway, like in terms of your chess study, like what what percentage do you think you're devoting to different aspects of your game? Like how much okay. tactics, how much end games, how much tournament review, all that stuff. OK, so I, I work with two coaches regularly and I see them. uh at least twice a month. Majority of the time I work with them, it's always middle game and end game. The openings I do by myself because I have access to engines and games. But when it comes to middle games and end games, that's pretty much all me and my coaches uh, work on. And I'm getting it from their perspective. One of my coaches is Orlando Husbands. He's an IM. He's like 2,400. And then I have a, a Cuban uh I am his name, Richard, I, I butcher his name, Levy or something. And we work on nothing but middle game and in game play. Ever since I've been working with them, I've been working with them for the last two years. That's all we work on. And it never changed. It's always something new and it's always something to work on uh, to improve on. I do the opening stuff by myself. Uh, I use Chessable. 
chess base, chessgames.com, stuff like that. But majority of the time, 75% of my study is uh, middle game and end game work. That's that's impressive. And what about now? I generally agree with you openings. I mean, especially like something like Chessable that they do such such an amazing job in terms of like helping helping you remember stuff again. Obviously, they're a sponsor of the podcast, but but I mean, I, I study it independent of that. But Derek, don't you have moments where like you don't understand a move and like because for me, sometimes even though I can drill openings on my own, I still need coaches to explain certain opening ideas. Oh yeah, prophylactics, is that's what you call it? Uh moves like that, move you don't understand. Yeah, stuff often it's prophylactics. Yeah. Yeah, uh of course, of course. I played uh a national master named John Brooks, and he's a he has an unorthodox style of play. And uh we had a position where it was like poker, like whoever held, you know what I'm saying? It was like we were bluffing each other. Yeah. And I played the move. I just played a simple pawn move, an H3, a, H3 or A3 weight move. And my move gave up my position, but his move still held his position. But if you saw it, it didn't make no sense. Right. And uh, it broke my spirit, and I couldn't understand it myself. And that's, you know, that's something I had to go to my coaches about. Because one thing about coaches is they see things different from you and they open up your train of thought to look at the board different. So next time we played, I was better prepared uh, for him, and we, we ended up having a draw over the board. I should have won the game, but it was a draw. So, yeah, that, that stuff really can happen to you. Yeah. And now, Derek, you mentioned in your interview with Kofi Tatum the cost of chess. Obviously, it can be an expensive hobby, especially because, as you mentioned, like often you have to travel to to find different opponents to play. And you also are working with two coaches. So how do you think about the expenses of hiring coaches? Is that like a, a bitter pill for you? Or are you just like, again, like whatever it takes? Well, with I think it, it varies on the person. With me, uh, I make it work. It's not hurting me now. But I I know chess players who who love chess that can't, can't afford it. And like I was telling Kofi Tatum, uh, I use the Chicago Open, for example. The entry fee is, what, 225 to go to 250 room and board. So you could easily be up front, just say about a grand, a grand. And that's not even without food and all that other stuff. The worst financial hit I ever took was the world open. And uh, the first time I went to the world open and uh, when I came back, I was pretty much broke the whole summer, <laughs> but I had so much invested in it. And I love chess so much, you know, I continue to uh, continue to play. So like I tell everybody, when you play chess, you're doing it because it's something you love and it's a passion. You see what I'm saying? And when you love something and you got a passion for something, you know, the cost cost does, you know, doesn't matter. Yeah. And for me, it's like if I'm thinking about going to a tournament, like I don't even let the thought of like winning money, like enter my head like that that money's just gone, you know, <laughs> like, like, you know, you can't think of it, you know, you just have to think of it as a hobby and you basically, you know what the cost will be like, and then you, you try to budget for it. And of course, as you say, it is understandable that it, it can be cost prohibitive for some people, but luckily in the internet age, you know, and with a lot of local tournaments in, in many places, like there are ways to find a play uh, that are less expensive. Yes, sir. Um, so, so, Derek, it's time for a sponsored segment. Um, this sponsored segment is called The Chess Stop Bomb. Now, Derek, you mentioned to me that that you you like to do puzzles and review your games on chess.com. Yes, sir. I'm a big chess.com fan. Nice. And I was and I wanted to alert listeners about a new feature. You guys might have caught wind of it because it's kind of a big deal. Um, Chess.com is doing a global chess championship. And in conjunction with that, they announced a new verification process. So, you know, I haven't been able to get verified on Twitter. I'm still small time. But on Chess.com, the way it works is if you spend, if you send them $15, uh, they'll do extra vetting to make sure you're not like an engine cheater. And then you can get verified and then you can compete sometimes in events in a pool of players that are also verified. And 
perhaps even more importantly, you can compete in the Just.com Global Championship, which is a big like multi-stage tournament with a million dollars in total prizes. Um, it's the only cost of that tournament is the verification cost, which is $15 initially and then $10 per year. Uh, for renewal. So, I mean, regular listeners to the pod know that I, I love to see chess sites, whatever, the, whichever ones they might be. I love to see them pushing the envelope and trying new events. Um, and I'm excited for this one. I mean, I have a feeling I'm not going to make the final in Toronto, um, but I'm sure there'll be some big dogs there and I'm excited to watch the whole process unfold. I'm undecided if I'm going to get my skull kish- kicked in by by these GMs, but it's nice that you get to play in the qualifying period. And if nothing else, if you get verified, then you uh, make sure that you're playing other legit people and you get a few good training games in. So, um, so Derek, you had mentioned before we were recording, you, you weren't even aware of the new uh, verified uh, offering from chess.com. Nope. You just, you just, I just learned something new today. All right. So perhaps you will check that out. And listeners, if you check it out and you use the link in the show description, uh, a small part of it will go to help support Perpetual Chess. But again, this should be a fun endeavor. So think about getting verified. Think about playing in this tournament. If nothing else, tune in for the chess.com global championship details, as always, in the show description. And that concludes the chess.bomb. So, Derek, last thing I really want to hit on is uh, what's next. I mean, you took to Twitter, and honestly, this was like, you know, obviously I've listened to your pod over the years, but this was what really made me check out uh, your graph and see this breakthrough that you had. But now you're on to the next one. Now you're pulling people about how to become a USCF master. So what, in your opinion, needs to be done? What do you need to do, Derek, to to go on to the next milestone? Uh. I think I have to improve my strategic play and my planning and my calculation. I think calculation is is key and uh calculation and tactics, but really really my calculations in wild not wild positions, but closed boring positions. Them positions that make you uh <laughs> I love fall it. asleep. <laughs> Fall asleep boring. boring. You know what I'm saying? Like really calculating them positions. And if I could get a grasp on that, I really believe that's going to uh, jumpstart me on my quest to becoming a national master, which I know I'm going to do. But really like them, them boring. I'm not going to say boring, but them solid, you know, like I I, I hate to say Karpoff again, but. (laughs) His, you know, that style of play where it's like nothing on the board and you could easily just fall asleep and get lazy and lose the game. Yeah. No, I mean, it's it's an important skill. So so how will you develop that skill, Derek? Uh, I'm 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 working with my coaches. Uh, We're trying like I'm playing a lot of those positions and uh, planning, having good plans. That's what they're telling me, looking at the board and assessing the position uh, and not take. This is something I'm going to say, because this happened with my kids. Try not taking a move off. Make sure every move you make means something. I know it sounds crazy like you should, you know, always do it. But sometimes we just get lazy at the board. And uh, that's something I got to work on, making sure every move means something, even if I'm playing H3 get my king escape square or just simple moves make sure every move means something not try to take a move off okay and you mentioned like getting the positions from your coaches in order to presume uh improve your positional play so are they giving you training positions like what what do you mean by that Derek? uh okay so like we just took a lesson last week we had tiger prestrosian positions and uh, Max Huey, if I'm pronouncing them names right, and they show me the techniques and the themes they use to seal the victory. So what I mean is they'll set up a position and they'll just say, look at this position and just say Karpoff is playing white and he's plus three and a half, right? He may be plus three and a half on the engine, but to the human, it may not look like that. And he'll tell you a white has an advantage and you have to convert that into a win. And we we go over the positions for hours and hours and hours till I get it right, or at least be in the right path or train of thought uh, to plan them concepts right. That makes sense. 
Yeah, yeah, that that definitely makes sense. So it sounds like your coaches have helped you a lot. Like, how how long have you had them, Derek? Okay, so if if you look at my graph, I was nineteen hundred. I think I got to nineteen thirty, and then I dropped right, and that's when I started working with my first coach. Uh, and then I went to nineteen hundred again. I went back up to 1900, shot up, and then I got that's when I started working with the second coach. So I use one coach for opening prep and the other coach majority for end game and uh middle game. So if you look at my chart, I think I went to the world open. I was 1900. I came back like 19 something. Then I went to Toledo and dropped under. So when you see me drop, I think I dropped to 1894. That's when I was like, I, I got to get a coach. I got to get a coach. Coaching is mandatory. If you want, and then they coach. look at. Do they look at your games? Of course, of course. I, I yeah, and they they go hard on me. It's like Bobby Knight how they uh go in and <laughs> some of my games, but they 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 nice. do they they look at my games. And one thing they also do is they tell me I have to go play. I have to go give them data for they can research and make improvements on my game. I just yeah, that's so it. important. I just they tell me all the time. Uh. You just can't sit here and play me and I just give you positions. I have to see what you're doing. You have to bring me back something before I can make improvements. Yeah. So because is key. Yeah. I mean, we all try to like study hack chess. You know, it's like we want to do the tactics to study hack the tactics. We want to do the openings to study to tack the to study hack the openings. But like every game is like a symphony with a beginning, middle, and an end, you know? And there's only like going and really competing. Especially to me, my bias is in tournaments, but obviously a lot of people listening play more online. If they can take it seriously, that works too. But but yeah, you just because there's all those little moments, you know, that you also need to know how to handle, like you mentioned, trying to trying to achieve something on every move. Yes, sir. Um, great. Well, well, Derek, this has been amazing. I mean, I'm excited to I'm excited to see what's next. I'm excited to see you try to break through to the next level. But I also just want to take this opportunity to sort of use Derek's journey to encourage listeners. I mean, you know, I try not to like over promise what people can achieve. I mean, obviously the adult improver series does spotlight people who've often had breakthroughs or achieved remarkable things. But I mean, for Derek, it was more just like a really long plateau and a lot of work that goes into that plateau, but then boom, like it did happen. And Derek, you know, like, uh, you know, I'm not even at my rating peak, but I'm, I'm out there grinding. I'm trying to get better again. And honestly, like when, when I look at your graph, it, it inspires me. I, I, again, I can sort of, I can see the blood, sweat and tears. I can imagine it when I see it. So congratulations again. Thank you so much. And I want to say one thing too. Sure. Low, lower rated players. Don't, be afraid to play in the open section. Yeah. Good, <laughs> good competition is tough. I, I generally, I don't know. Like I, I'm, I'm not entirely in tune with like how it works now, but I've, I've often found that playing one section up is the way to go because I definitely agree with you that you want to play people stronger than you. The best thing is just to lose a bunch of games, but Sometimes at at one point I noticed, especially in the like continental chess tournaments here in the U.S., if you play in the open, you often end up with all the other. Like if you're like a thirteen hundred that decides you're going to play in the open, after three or four rounds, you'll be with the other thirteen hundreds that decided you're going to play in the open. Whereas, whereas if you're like a thirteen hundred and you decide you're going to play in the under eighteen hundred, like that's not it doesn't work that way. You know, there's no thirteen hundreds there trying to play grandmasters. So. You might you might lose a couple games and play people on the lower end of the rating spectrum, but they'll still be rated fifteen, sixteen hundred. So I agree about the tougher competition, but you may not want to play the actual open section depending on what level you are. But but I love the advice about tougher competition, Derek. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, all right. Well, Derek, any other parting words or advice before we let you out of here? I know we got slowed down by a couple technical difficulties. No, I just want to say uh, I'm a fan of this podcast. I'm so happy to be on here. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. I actually heard about you from Yelan Swartz. Uh, Shout out to Elon. Yeah, my old friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you said, it, I like what you're doing. Keep it up. Great content. And I like you said, uh, thank you so much. God is good. Likewise, yeah. And Detroit Chess Killers, Killers, excuse me, is D's podcast. And D, before we go, I do need to give a shout out to 
the recent Patreon subs on Perpetual Chess, Colin Pesnia and Basil Henrik. Thanks for uh, pledging to support Perpetual Chess via Patreon. And yeah, D, looking forward to uh, to further progress down the road. And uh, and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network, with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters. Those who choose to join that community based on their level of support can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show, going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, But most of all, thanks to everyone for listening, and we will catch you all on the next episode.